Historian, show where we read about half an hour of history together. My name is Jason Kishinev. I thank you for tuning in. We're reading chapter nine of a people's history of the United States. And remember, if you like what you hear tonight, uh, go ahead and hit the like and subscribe button and that notification bell so you get notified when I make a video. Let's dig in. The Fugitive Slave Act passed in 1850 was a concession to the southern states in return for the admission of the Mexican War Territories, California especially, into the Union as non-slave states. The act made it easy for slave owners to recapture ex-slaves or simply to pick up blacks they claimed had run away. Northern blacks organized resistance to the Fugitive Slave Act denouncing President Fillmore, who signed it, and Senator Daniel Webster, who supported it. One of these was J.W. Loguen, or Logen, son of a slave mother and her white owner. He had escaped in freedom on his master's horse, gone to college, and was now a minister in Syracuse, New York. He spoke to a meeting in that city in 1850. The time has come to change the tones of submission into tones of defiance and to tell Mr. Fillmore and Mr. Webster if they propose to execute this measure upon us to send on their bloodhounds. I received my freedom from heaven and with it came the command to defend my title to it. I don't respect this law. I don't fear it. I won't obey it. It outlaws me and I outlaw it. I will not live a slave and if forced to and if force is employed to re-enslave me, I shall make preparations to meet the crisis as becomes a man. Your decision tonight in favor of resistance will give vent to the spirit of liberty and it will break the bands of party and shout for joy all over the north. Heaven knows that this act of Noble daring will break out somewhere, and may God grant that Syracuse be the honored spot whence it shall send an earthquake voice through the land. The following year, Syracuse had its chance. A runaway slave named Jerry was captured and put on trial. A crowd used crowbars and a battering ram to break into the courthouse defying marshals with drawn guns and set Jerry free. Lo Gwen, that's how I'm going to have to pronounce his name, Lo Gwen, Lo Gwen made his home in Syracuse, a major station on the Underground Railroad. It was said that he helped 1,500 slaves on their way to Canada. His memoir of slavery came to the attention of his former mistress and she wrote to him asking him either to return or to send her a thousand dollars in compensation. <laughs> Le Guin's reply to her was printed in the abolitionist newspaper The Liberator. Mrs. Sarah Logue. Interesting, her name was Logue and his name was Le Guin. So I think her name is probably pronounced Logue. So should I pronounce his name Logan? Looks too weird to pronounce Logan. Mrs. Sarah Logue, you say you have offers to buy me and that you shall sell me if I do not send you a thousand dollars. And in the same breath and almost in the same sentence, you say, you know we raised you as we did our own children. Woman, did you raise your own children for the market? 
Did you raise them for the whipping post? Did you raise them to be driven off, bound to a coffee and coffle and chains? Shame on you! But you say I am a thief because I took the old mare along with me. Have you got to learn that I had a better right to that old mare, as you call her, than Manaseth Lode had to me? Is it a greater sin for me to steal his horse than it was for him to rob my mother's cradle and steal me? Have you got to learn that human rights are mutual and reciprocal? And if you take my liberty and life, you forfeit your own liberty and life. Before God and high heaven, is there a law for one man which is not a law for every other man? If you or any other speculator on my body and rights wish to know how I regard my rights, they need but come here and lay their hands on me to enslave me. Yours, etc. J.W. Lo Gwen. Sorry if you hate these pronunciations. I'm doing my best. Frederick Douglass knew that the shame of slavery was not just the South's, that the whole nation was complicit in it. Oh yes, there was slavery in the North. On the 4th of July, 1852, he gave an Independence Day address. Fellow citizens, pardon me and allow me to ask why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I, therefore, called upon to bring our humbled offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty, an unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation of the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Go where you may, search where you will, Roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world. Travel through South America. Search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, lay your facts by the side of the everyday practices of this nation, and you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without a rival. Ten years after Nat Turner's rebellion, there was no sign of black insurrection in the South. But that year, 1841, one incident took place which kept alive the idea of rebellion. Slaves being transported on a ship, the Creole, overpowered the crew, killed one of them, and sailed into the British West Indies, where slavery had been abolished in 1833. England refused to return the slaves. There was much agitation in England against American slavery. And this led to angry talk in Congress of war with England, encouraged by Secretary of State Daniel Webster. The colored people's press denounced Webster's bullying position and recalling the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812 wrote, If war be declared... We will fight in defense of a government which denies us the most... Excuse me. Let me start that over. 
If war be declared, will we fight in defense of a government which denies us the most precious right of citizenship? The states in which we dwell have twice availed us themselves of our voluntary services and have repaid us with chains and slavery. Shall we a third time kiss the foot that crushes us? If so, we deserve our chains. As the tension grew north and south, blacks became more militant. Frederick Douglass spoke in 1857. Hold on a sec. Sorry. Frederick Douglass spoke in 1857. Let me give you a word of the philosophy of reforms. The whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet made to her august claims have been born of struggle. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Heard that phrase before, huh? <clears throat> There were tactical differences between Douglas and William Lloyd Garrison, white abolitionist and editor of The Liberator, differences between black and white abolitionists in general, of course. Blacks were more willing to engage in armed insurrection, but also more ready to use existing political devices, the ballot box, the Constitution, anything to further their cause. They were not as morally absolute in their tactics as the Garrisonians. Moral pressure would not do it alone, the blacks knew. It would take all sorts of tactics, from elections to rebellion. However present in the minds of northern Negroes was the question of slavery as shown by black children in a Cincinnati school, a private school financed by Negroes, the children were responding to the question, what do you think most about? Only five answers remain in the records and all refer to slavery. A seven-year-old child wrote, Dear schoolmates, we are going next summer to buy a farm and to work part of the day and to study the other part if we live to see it and come home part of the day to see our mothers and sisters and cousins if we are got any and see our kind folks and to be good boys and when we get a man to get the poor slaves from bondage I am sorrow to hear the boat went down with 200 poor slaves from up the river oh how sorrow I am to hear that it grieves my heart so that I could faint in one minute White abolitionists did courageous and pioneering work on the lecture platform, in newspapers, in the Underground Railroad. Black abolitionists, less publicized, were the backbone of the anti-slave movement. Before Garrison published his famous Liberator in Boston in 1831, the first national convention of Negroes had been held. David Walker had already written his appeal and a black abolitionist magazine named Freedom's Journal had appeared. Of the Liberator's first 25 subscribers, most were black. Blacks had to struggle constantly with the unconscious racism of white abolitionists. They also had to insist on their own independent voice. Douglas wrote for the Liberator, but in 1847 started his own newspaper in Rochester, North Star, which led to a break with Garrison. In 1854, a conference of Negroes declared, It is emphatically our battle. No one else can fight it for us. 
Our relations to the anti-slavery movement must be and are changed. Instead of depending upon it, we must lead it. Certain black women face the triple hurdle of being abolitionists in a slave society, of being black among white reformers, and of being women in a reform movement dominated by men. When Sojourner Truth rose to speak in 1853 in New York City at the 4th National Women's Rights Convention, it all came together. There was a hostile mob in the hall shouting, jeering, threatening. She said, I know that it feels a kind of hissing and tickling like to see a colored woman get up and tell you about things and women's rights. We have all been thrown down so low that nobody thought we'd ever get up again, but we will come up again, and now I'm here. We'll have our rights. See if we don't, and you can't stop us from them. See if you can. You may hiss as much as you like, but it is coming. I am sitting among you to watch, and every once in a while, I will come out and tell you what time of night it is. <laughs> Sorry. After Nat Turner's violent uprising, <laughs> after Nat Turner's violent uprising in Virginia's bloody repression, the security system inside the South became tighter. Perhaps only an outsider could hope to launch a rebellion. It was such a person, a white man of ferocious courage and determination, John Brown, whose wild scheme it was to seize the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, and then set off a revolt of slaves throughout the South. Harriet Tubman, five feet tall, some of her teeth missing, a veteran of countless secret missions piloting blacks out of slavery was involved with John Brown and his plans. But sickness prevented her from joining him. Frederick Douglass, too, had met with Brown. He argued against the plan from the standpoint of its chances of success, but he admired the ailing man of 60, tall, gaunt, white-haired. Douglass was right. The plan would not work. The local militia, joined by a hundred marines under the command of Robert E. Lee, surrounded the insurgents. Although his men were dead or captured, John Brown refused to surrender. He barricaded himself in a small brick building near the gate of the armory. The troops battered down a door. Oh, excuse me. The troops battered down a door. A Marine lieutenant moved in and struck Brown with his sword. Wounded, sick, he was interrogated. W.E.B. Du Bois, in his book John Brown, writes, Picture the situation. An old and blood-bespattered man, half dead from the wounds inflicted but a few hours before. A man lying in the cold and dirt without sleep for 55 nerve-wracking hours without food for nearly as long with the dead bodies of his two sons almost before his eyes, the piled corpses of his seven slain comrades near and afar, a wife and a bereaved family listening in vain, and a lost cause, the dream of a lifetime lying dead in his heart. Lying there, interrogated by the governor of Virginia, Brown said, You had better, all you people at the South, prepare yourselves for a settlement of this question. You may dispose of me very easily. I am nearly disposed of now. But this question is still to be settled. This Negro question, I mean. The end of that is not yet. Du Bois appraises Brown's action. It is his foray, excuse me, if his foray was the work of a handful of fanatics led by a lunatic and repudiated by the slaves to a man, 
then the proper procedure would have been to ignore the incident, quietly punish the worst offenders and either pardon the misguided leader or send him to an asylum. While insisting that the raid was too hopelessly and ridiculously small to accomplish anything, the state nevertheless spent $250,000 to punish the invaders, stationed from one to 3,000 soldiers in the vicinity and threw the nation into turmoil. In John Brown's last written statement in prison before he was hanged, he said, I, John Brown, am quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. Ralph Waldo Emerson, not an activist himself, said of the execution of John Brown, he will make the gallows holy as the cross. Of the 22 men in John Brown's striking force, five were black. Two of these were killed on the spot. One escaped, and two were hanged by the authorities. Before his execution, John Copeland wrote to his parents, Remember that if I must die, I die in trying to liberate a few of my poor and oppressed people from my condition of servitude, which God in his holy writ has hurled his most bitter denunciations against. I am not terrified by the gallows. I imagine that I hear you, and all of you, mother, father, sisters, and brothers, say, No, there is not a cause for which we, with less sorrow, could see you die. Believe me when I tell you that though shut up in prison and under sentence of death, I have spent more happy hours here, and I would almost as leaf, L-I-E-F, I, was, I would almost as lief die now as at any time, for I feel that I am prepared to meet my maker. <clears throat> John Brown was executed by the state of Virginia with the approval of the national government. It was the national government which, while weakly enforcing the law ending the slave trade, sternly enforced the laws providing for the return of fugitives to slavery. It was the national government that, in Andrew Jackson's administration, collaborated with the South to keep abolitionist literature out of the mails in the southern states. It was the Supreme Court of the United States that declared in 1857 that the slave Dred Scott could not sue for his freedom because he was not a person, but property. Such a national government would never accept an end to slavery by rebellion. It would end slavery only under conditions controlled by whites, and only when required by the political and economic needs of the business elite of the North. It was Abraham Lincoln who combined perfectly the needs of business, the political ambition of the new Republican Party, and the rhetoric of humanitarianism. Remember, he was the first Republican president. Republicans were a third party at this time. He would keep the abolition of slavery not at the top of his list of priorities, but close enough to the top so it could be pushed there temporarily by abolitionist pressures and by practical political advantage. Lincoln could skillfully blend the interests of the very rich and the interests of the black at a moment in history when these interests met, and he could link these two with a growing section of Americans, the white, up-and-coming, economically ambitious, politically active middle class. As Richard Hofstadter puts it, thoroughly middle class in his ideas, he spoke for those millions of Americans who had begun their lives as hired workers, as farmhands, clerks, teachers, merchants, flatboatmen, and rail splitters, and had passed into the ranks of landed farmers, prosperous grocers, lawyers, merchants, physicians, and politicians. Lincoln could argue with lucidity and passion against slavery on moral grounds, while acting cautiously in practical politics. He believed 
that the institution of slavery is founded on injustice and bad policy, but that the promulgation of abolition doctrines tends to increase rather than abate its evils. Put against this Frederick Douglass's statement on struggle or garrisons, Sir, slavery will not be overthrown without excitement, a most tremendous excitement. Lincoln read the Constitution strictly to mean that Congress, because of the Tenth Amendment, reserving to the states powers not specifically given to the national government, could not constitutionally bar slavery in the states. When it was proposed to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia, which did not have the rights of a state, but was directly under the jurisdiction of Congress, as it is today, Lincoln said this would be constitutional, but it should not be done unless the people in the district wanted it. Since most there were white, this killed the idea. As Hofstadter said of Lincoln's statement, it breathes the fire of an uncompromising insistence on moderation. Lincoln refused to denounce the fugitive state law publicly. Excuse me, fugitive slave law publicly. He wrote to a friend, I confess I hate to see the poor creatures hunted down, but I bite my lips and keep quiet. And when he did propose in 1849, as a congressman, a resolution to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia, he accompanied this with a section requiring local authorities to arrest and return fugitive slaves coming into Washington. This led Wendell Phillips, the Boston abolitionist, to refer to him years later as that slave hound from Illinois. He opposed slavery, but could not see blacks as equals. So a constant theme in his approach was to free the slaves and to send them back to Africa. In his 1858 campaign in Illinois for the Senate against Stephen Douglas, Lincoln spoke differently depending on the views of his listeners, and also perhaps depending on how close it was to the election. Speaking in northern Illinois in July in Chicago, he said, let us discard all this quibbling about this man and this other man, this race and that race and the other race being inferior, and therefore they must be placed in an inferior position. Let us discard all these things and unite as one people throughout this land until we shall once more stand up declaring that all men are created equal. It's pretty good. Two months later in Charleston, in southern Illinois, Lincoln told his audience, I will, this is later, two months later, I will say then that I am not, nor have I ever been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. Applause. That I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. And insomuch as they cannot so live while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior, and I as much as any other man am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. Wow. Lincoln really said that. You aren't taught that in high school, are you? Behind the, the secession of the South from the Union after Lincoln was elected president in the fall of 1860 as candidate of the new Republican Party was a long series of policy clashes between South and North. The clash was not over slavery as a moral institution. Most Northerners did not care enough about slavery to make sacrifices for it. Certainly not the sacrifice of war. It was not a clash of peoples. Most northern whites were not economically favored. 
not politically powerful. Most Southern whites were poor farmers, not decision makers, but of elites. The Northern elite wanted economic expansion, free land, free labor, a free market, a high p free market, <laughs> a high protective tariff for manufacturers, a bank of the United States. The slave interests opposed all of that. They saw Lincoln and the Republicans as making continuation of their pleasant and prosperous way of life impossible in the near future. So when Lincoln was elected, seven southern states seceded from the Union. Lincoln initiated hostilities by trying to repossess the federal base at Fort Sumter, South Carolina, and four more states seceded. The Confederacy was formed. The Civil War was on. Lincoln's first inaugural address in March 1861 was conciliatory toward the South and the seceded states. I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. And with the war four months on, when General John C. Fremont in Missouri declared martial law, and said, slave o and said slaves of owners resisting the United States were to be free. Lincoln countermanded this order. He was anxious to hold in the Union the slave states of Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, and Delaware. I don't really think of, Missouri, of uh, Maryland and Delaware as having been slave states. But huh, live and learn. <clears throat> it was only as the war grew more bitter, the casualties mounted, desperation to win heightened, desperation to win heightened, and the criticism of the abolitionists threatened to unravel the tattered coalition behind Lincoln that he began to act against slavery. Hofstadter puts it this way, like a delicate barometer, he recorded the trend of pressures, and as the radical pressure increased, he moved toward the left. Wendell Phillips said that if Lincoln was able to grow, it is because we have watered him. <laughs> Racism in the North was as entrenched as slavery in the South, and it would take the war to shape both. New York blacks could not vote unless they owned $250 in property, a qualification not applied to whites. A proposal to abolish this, put on the ballot in 1860, was defeated two to one, although Lincoln carried New York by 50,000 votes. Frederick Douglass commented, the black baby of Negro suffrage was thought too ugly to exhibit on so grand an occasion. The Negro was stowed away like some people put out of sight their deformed children when company comes. And I'm going to close there. Thank you for joining me. Do, do tune in for the next episode. We'll see you then. In the meantime, hit that like and subscribe button. Thank you.